Jesus' name, amen. Over to you, Andrew. Amen. Thank you very much, Russ. Thank you for praying for us. Um, it's great to be with you this morning. And uh, we're going to be continuing on our series through Isaiah 61. This morning, we're going to be looking at what it meant for the readers in those days, but also what it looks for us like now, in the middle of lockdown, in the context we're in. How do we take the Bible? How do we apply this stuff into our lives? And we're going to be looking at the theme of his purpose. I mean, purpose, that's a, that's a pretty big word. So, I don't know, I'm rubbish at spelling. I often seem to find myself in the dictionary. So, if you find yourself uh, heading to the Oxford Dictionary, then you might find this definition. The intention, aim, or function of something. That seems slightly wordy to me, so I like this one instead. The thing that something is supposed to achieve. I like that, how that made it into the Oxford Dictionary. I'm not 100% sure, but hey, it's in there. How are you feeling about your purpose? We're in the middle of lockdown 3.0. And I'm wondering if you even still wonder if you have a normal purpose, if you have a purpose. So please stick with me this morning, because Isaiah 61 is a message of hope. It is certainly a message of hope for all of us. So please journey with me as we, as we explore this. And it's going to take a bit to unpick. Why is that? Well, let me encourage you, if you haven't already listened to Tim's preach from last week, please do so. You're already on an online platform. You're on Facebook or YouTube watching this. Let me encourage you, head back to last week's uh, preach and watch what Tim had to say, because it is absolute gold. And the reason it's going to take a bit to unpick this is because this, this passage kind of operates at three different levels. It's a, it's a bit complicated to unpick, but it's not too arduous, so stick with me. Because as we go through it, you'll find there's a message of hope for everyone in this. So I'm going to read. I'm going to read just the first uh, three, no, two and a half verses of Isaiah 61. And the words will be on screen. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. Let me pray again. We can't pray enough at the moment. Lord God, I pray that this morning as we consider this passage, as we look at your son, Jesus, and we look at his purpose, Lord God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move on each of us and help us realize that his purpose is towards us and outworks through us. Lord God, we are your children. And Lord God, I pray this morning you would send your Holy Spirit and help each of us encounter you and live differently as a response to this. Amen. So the first thing we're going to consider today is his purpose towards us. And in order to do that, I want to start where the passage starts. And I want to talk about the poor. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to who? To the poor. I can't really express how important it is that we spend a moment just pausing and thinking about this. It's so immensely important. And my fear is that if we don't grapple with this concept of who the poor are, then we can miss something quite major. We can keep moving through this series and we can do things out of duty or we can get lost in the passage or we can become confused. So let's take a moment and pause and think about who are the poor. I don't know if you ever play word association, cracking game, definitely one for our youth that we often play. And I wonder where your mind jumps when I say the poor. I know that in our culture, my mind goes straight to those who are materially poor. It goes to those who are in financial times of need, and it goes at the extreme end of that, if I'm honest, it goes to those who are homeless. That's where my mind just instantly goes by word association when I think of the poor. And this is true. People who are materially and financially poor are poor. But that's not the whole meaning of what's being laid out here in the passage. How do we know this? Well, the passage goes on to talk about the brokenhearted. 
It talks about captives. It talks about prisoners of darkness. It's clearly not just talking about people who are in uh, material need, but it's talking about people who are poor in many ways and those who are in times of spiritual need. (coughs) This passage talks of spiritual brokenness and poverty, but somehow we need to move our heads and our thoughts away from that word association game I was playing a moment ago. We need to move away from the cultural context which we often think of the poor. Therefore, let me ask you this. Do you remember when you were spiritually poor? And I don't just mean remember. I want you to take a moment to really consider, consider strongly the time when you were so poor, the Bible actually says you were dead in your sin. That is how poor we were. We were in this place of spiritual poverty. We didn't know Christ. You and I did not yet have a relationship with Christ and had not been set free from our sin. I know I can remember that time. I was a teenager. I was was doing good things. I was a morally good sort of kid. My parents might disagree, but there we go. And I knew about God, but I didn't know God. I was so spiritually poor, and to be perfectly honest with you, it wasn't until I became spiritually rich, I think I realized just how poor I actually was. But there is good news. There is good news to be proclaimed to the poor, and it's this, that God came into our utter lostness and our spiritual poverty. He came, if you will, into our death and bought us a spiritual CPR and revived us back to life, but went beyond bringing us back. He made us right with God. He sent Jesus Christ into this earth to bring a message of spiritual hope, that we could have a new life if we believe in him. That is the good news we hear Jesus proclaiming, that it is him, it is God who has come to bind up broken hearts, to set captives free, and to bring release for people who are in darkness. If only people will turn away from their sin and turn their life and put it back on Jesus. Do you need to be made spiritually rich today? Do you need to be set free? Do you need brokenness in your life to be mended? If so, please call on the name of Jesus and he will reach out to you. He will restore you. He will make you spiritually rich today. He will put you into a right relationship with him and he will do all of those things if you call on him. But in this passage, this isn't just where the good news ends. There's even more about his purpose towards us. And if you blink, you can miss it. But it's there within the passage. It's easy to miss because if you're anything like me, you read the Bible and you put yourself into the Bible. You put yourself into the story. You read David and Goliath and you're there, David. Yeah, you're flinging stones around and killing Goliath and cutting off his head. That's, uh, maybe that's just me. But when we put ourselves into scripture, it's easy, therefore, to make it mismatch slightly and miss certain things that it has for us. And it's particularly easy here because you read it in first person. So we read, I am anointed to do this stuff. That's true. There's layers to this, as Tim said last week, and we're going to explore that in a bit. But the first thing you need to hear is this is not about you. Isaiah is not prophesying about Dave, about Rach, about Julie, about Charlie. No, he is talking about Jesus Christ. These are the words of Jesus Christ we hear here because it's his mission It was Jesus who was anointed to bind up the brokenhearted. It was Jesus who was anointed to proclaim freedom for the captives. It's Jesus who was to release prisoners from darkness. And not only was Christ anointed to do this stuff, but he was first and foremost anointed to do this this stuff for the church. Huh? (laughs) Something I think I've missed before. But there's a subtle clue in there, and it has massive implications for us as we read. 
It says in verse 2, to proclaim the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those in Zion. In Zion, there's the clue. This is for believers. This is for people who are saved, who've turned their life back to Jesus Christ. This message is for you if you are hurting this morning. See, Isaiah was speaking to the Jews at the time. They'd been exiled. They'd been kicked out of their land. They'd been sent out. They were dispersed. Not only that, but they were low. They were hurting. They were upset. They were confused. And they were wondering, what on earth has God done? And what is God going to do? Does any of that sound vaguely familiar? (laughs) In the middle of lockdown, are you wondering what is going on? Are you fed up? Are you hurting over losses from last year? Are you anxious about how a return to normal life is going to work when at the moment it feels like just getting through one week is enough of a slog? Well, hear this because this message of release, of binding up and of freedom is for you this morning because it is for those in Zion. It is for the church. And let me level with you, I needed to hear this recently. I want to share with you, not for, for, not for need of pity, not for, not for anything like that this morning, but because I want to just show that God can minister to us and continues to minister to us who believe. Over the Christmas period, I was fortunate enough to have some leave. And, um, and it's probably the first time over last year I actually managed to get some time off where I could really just relax. I could let my brain switch off from loads that was going on, and I actually had a bit of downtime. But something happened. There was something small which happened in our life, and it was like the straw that broke the camel's back. And I suddenly realized I was low. I was quite quite emotionally wrung out and tired. And there was lots going on. I realized that I was grieving things from last year. I was grieving relationships that we'd lost as a family and that had impacted on the life of our children. I was upset seeing some of our youth disappear away from our youth group, not knowing if they would return and how they were getting on. I hadn't taken time to think about all of the changes in jobs I'd been through last year. Working in the hospital during the first wave of COVID, getting messages from colleagues who were struggling having health issues in our family. The list goes on and on and on. I don't need to air everything to you, but I can guarantee you're sat at home probably with fairly similar lists. It has been a heavy time. To put it in a nutshell, I was mourning and I was brokenhearted and I needed Jesus to come and bind my heart back up again. I needed to hear the good news that Jesus would pick me up and restore me. That is his purpose towards us. So I started praying about these things. I started pulling each one out singularly, writing about it, sitting there, praying, allowing God to speak to me and minister to me and heal me and restore me back into a right relationship with him. So how are you today? In lockdown 3.0, how are you feeling? Let him restore you. Are you feeling bound up? Let him free you. Are you full of despair about the future, only seeing darkness? Let him bring his light in, because he wants to do that. That is the good news. Jesus and his never-ending faithful love will get you through challenging times. He will restore you. He has promised to continually restore us until the day of vengeance when he comes back to make the world right as it will one day be. He promises to journey that journey with us and continually heal us. So hear that today. If you are tired, hear that. And as we've explored his purpose towards us though, We also, as Tim helpfully reminded us last week, need to explore another layer. And it's this, that he has a purpose through us. We are to continue being like Christ all the time. 
to help those around us who are hurting, who are held captive, who are in prison. That is his mission, his purpose, sorry, through us. We see Jesus doing this throughout his ministry. Remember a moment ago we were chatting about word association. Who is it we think of when we think of the poor? Well, we see Jesus expanding our horizon about who is poor. He helps those who are materially poor, but also spiritually poor. Sorry, materially rich, but spiritually poor. And we see him helping those who have poor health, people who have a poor state of spirituality. We see him helping Zacchaeus. He's this rich guy. He's this rich tax collector written about in the Bible who's been charging people more money than he should have done. And then he's been keeping that for himself. He's rich, but spiritually he's poor. Does that sound like your neighbor? Your neighbor who's got the nice car, got the big house, got everything, but have they got everything or are they spiritually poor? We see Jesus' interaction with this guy. He goes back to his house for dinner and in a moment, in an interaction with Jesus, Zacchaeus' life is flipped upside down. He is made spiritually new again and it impacts the whole rest of his life. It's an amazing story. But we don't just see Jesus dealing with people like that. We then see another incident where we have Jesus teaching and a paralyzed man comes, is brought to him. A guy on a mat. He's physically poor. He's probably materially poor. And we know he's spiritually poor. And he's got these four mates who bring him. They can't get into the room where Jesus is. There's too many people. So they dig a hole through the roof and they lower this guy in front of Jesus. And what do we see Jesus do? He restores. He restores health to the man. He heals him. And then he binds up his spiritual life by forgiving his sins and saying, you are forgiven, get up, take your mat and go. How incredible is that? We see Jesus healing in all sorts of ways and to all sorts of people, much like the fact we have all sorts of different friends, family, colleagues in our life all the time who need to hear about Jesus. But it raises an important point. Because like I said, loads of us at the moment feel tired. And when I talk about the word purpose, it can be like, oh, come on, Andy. Are you serious? I'm knackered. There's no way I can bring myself to think about being on mission for Jesus in the middle of everything else that's going on. Can I encourage you, though, in two ways now? The first of those is that even if we're tired, we can show people the healing we received and witness to them through doing that. We can show them our brokenness and the restoration work Jesus is doing in our lives, and that will witness to them. This kintsugi grace that Russ and Tim have chatted about the last few weeks, restoring broken pottery by having gold run through it, that's the grace which is available to us. And as we share with others our brokenness, our utter brokenness, and the fact Jesus is constantly restoring us, it's not a one-time thing. This is going on and on and on in my life. And as I speak to others, that tells them so much about our amazing God. But the second thing we see here is it's Jesus' mission to bind up the brokenhearted. Bring people to Jesus. You don't have to do this. The complexity of the layers here is quite amazing because as I've said, this prophecy was about Jesus. It's Jesus who binds up broken hearts. It's Jesus who brings light into people's lives. And it is Jesus who sets prisoners free. And we are called to love and support people on their journey. Yes, absolutely. But we are not called to bind up the broken hearted in that way. We are called to point them back to Jesus all the time. It's him who's going to bind up their broken hearts. It's him who's going to bring light into their lives. And it is Jesus Christ who will bring the freedom to set captives free. It is him that we point to all the time. And we help people along that journey. For some of you, you're hearing this and you're thinking, I'm not feeling particularly low. 
You're fired up. You're ready to go. You're like, yes, get me out there on this mission for Jesus. And that's awesome. The mission is the same. Nothing changes. It's just that your reach right now is probably a lot greater and your capacity may well also be greater. So can I ask you to actively consider how you can help meet the needs of vulnerable people across our town? Have you asked, for instance, questions of the community hub? Have you got in contact to find out what is going on? At the food bank, is there space for people to be helping? Has today made you consider safer families and actually a role you might be able to pick up with them? Could you think about opening your home when children's services are struggling? Could you think about adopting or fostering a vulnerable child in need? And at a time when there are so many lonely, dispersed people across our town, Could you find a way to befriend somebody who is lonely, checking in on them regularly and loving them? I haven't mentioned all the options, obviously, and equally, all of these things seem to start at a material level. But as we've seen, Jesus often helped people who needed healing, who needed material needs met, and then that opened up a route to help expose their spiritual need and actually That's often where we start, helping with the material and physical need. And that helps us um, help others understand how spiritually poor they are and how the love of Jesus in their life can absolutely change everything. So as I ask the band to come back up, I want to remind us that it's Jesus Christ who came to uh, bind up the brokenhearted. He came to set prisoners free and bring light into the darkest of all places. And we are an extension of that mission to the town around us. So where are you at? Where are you at this morning? Have you ever made a decision to let Jesus restore and mend your life and set you into the true freedom that he has for you? Have you allowed him to make you spiritually rich, turning your life around from where it was and saying, Jesus, I give my life to you. Do with me what you will do. If you haven't made that decision, please, this morning, call on his name. He will listen, he will respond, and he will heal you and make you one of his followers. If you've already given your life to him, then what are the areas of your life where there's brokenness? Where do you need binding back up? Where are there dark areas where you need the light of Christ to shine in? And where are you held captive and you need to see freedom? Ask God right now to minister to you. Ask his Holy Spirit to show you areas where he can be working in your life. There are going to be uh, Zoom prayer rooms open from now until the end of the meeting, can I encourage you, if you want somebody else to get alongside you and pray for you, then please follow the link and go through and have somebody pray for you this morning. And as we look to be like Jesus to those around you, what is everyone's next step in this? Is it for you to be more vulnerable with those around you? to share some of your brokenness and where Jesus' grace has bound up your life and share some of the good news with people around you? Or are you able to think of a greater capacity and to be able to, to find extra time to serve in a ministry or a charity that we are partnering with to help the poor and the vulnerable in our town and point them all the while back to the freedom that Jesus Christ can bring into their life. What is your next step? So let me encourage us today that this message from Isaiah 61 is as much for us who are saved as for those who are not yet saved. Let's continue to fulfill his purpose towards us and let him heal the areas of our life that need healing, all the while being an extension of his healing to the town around us who is spiritually poor and need to know the love of Jesus Christ in their lives. Let's continue to pray for his restoration in us and in our town. Amen.